Okay, good evening folks. Welcome back to another episode of the Engine Shed. Um, today I thought I'd just do a quick video um, while I had it all set up and ready to go on how I reprogram Locos. So in front of me here I've got this Black 5. I've had this thing sitting in storage since probably about 2016. It's been an utter nightmare of mine because it's never been a consistent runner and I've never really put the time or effort into re rebuilding and repairing it. And, um, Anyway, long story short, I've now done that. Um, turns out there was quite a large build-up of crap on the on the wiper pickups and the actual tender pickups in the tender weren't even making contact with the wheel, which is why it was performing so poorly on the track. So now that's been fixed, um, I thought I'd put a quality decoder in it just to see how much better it runs. So I picked up a Locksound V4, apologies, a Lock Pilot version 4. And this thing is um, hopefully going to run a lot better. So before we do anything, I'm just going to essentially create a new loco on the Ecos. But I thought I'd show you all how I do it, how you can access it on the computer, and um, how you program a loco with an ESU Ecos. So let's get started. Okay, so we're here at the computer. Um, now, I understand a lot of people probably don't have the luxury of having a computer and an ECOS, but you know, nevertheless, if you do have an ECOS and you want to know how to cook it up to uh, to your computer, um, it's very, very easy. The, the, the factory way of accessing the default menu in this thing is you find the IP of the actual unit itself and you simply type it in. Okay. And then what will happen is when you type that number in, it'll come up with the actual menu of the ECOS. Now this is where you go through and op upload all your loco images, um, firmware updates, store configuration, restore or reset the factory conditions, restart. You can do all that remotely, but that's not what we want today. So what you actually need to make this work is what's called a VNC, a virtual network client. Um, and if you find one of those online, all you need to do is do exactly the same thing. So find the IP of the address of the actual device. You find that in settings page two on the ECOS, and then you can exit this, and we open up the VNC viewer. So this is just called VNC viewer, quite literally. You can Google it, download it for your own purposes. Um, I've already got this one set up, so all you need to do essentially is just go up into here, enter IP 192.168, and this will be a different point to everybody. Okay, and there you have it. So this, is the screen that you will see on your ECOS, but it's on your computer monitor now. So it's really, really handy if you've got a workbench like I do with a computer at it, and the ECOS is to your left, or it's just, it's not fun. Believe me, it's not fun trying to do anything on the ECOS with a stylus and a tiny screen. Um, so it's nice that this feature actually exists. So, so we're gonna create a new loco. So this is a brand new decoder. We haven't done anything with it. Um, what I typically like to do, just to make sure that everything is okay with these things, is I'll just do a factory reset on these things anyway, just to make sure that everything is okay. So to do a factory reset on a Dakota, it's always usually CV8 is equal to 8. So to do that on an ECOS, what you need to do is you go up into this tab here. Um, you can't see the cursor, it's really, really small, but you click on this tab here with the spanner. You want to go to Setup 2 and you'll come be greeted with this page and it's the first icon on the left in the top left hand corner called program DCC. So mode, programming track, that's the one we want. You can see it's already set up. So we want to go down here into CV8, CV, you can see the read and the write. So if we just go CV read, 151, so that's pretty standard, but what we're going to do Okay, so we're going to set CV8 to 8. So just for my peace of mind, I know that the decoder is actually set to address default 3. It's not something else. I've had that happen in the past where I've bought locomotives with decoders in them um, out of the factory box and the default address hasn't been 3. So that's how you go around or get around doing that. Uh, different manufacturers have different things, but you know, use typical Hornby, Barkman, ESU, um, Zemo, they all use that default CV8 um, is equal to 8, will reset to factory conditions, so we've done that. Okay, so you can see here I've got this blank space with no loco selected on the right hand screen. We're just going to create a new loco. 
New Loco create manually. And this is the fun part. You can go into the advanced tab and all you need to do is go start. Okay, now it will immediately detect what decoder is on the track. And in about 10 seconds, it should come up with Lockpilot version 4. And there it is, Lockpilot version 4 DCC. Now, a ridiculous thing about these Lockpilot decoders is there's 561 CVs in here. So um, we're just going to let it run its course. You'll see the video speed up a bit while this progress bar fills in. So we'll be back in a minute. Okay, so we're now done. So that took about a minute to two minutes. Um, the larger CV decoders like your lock pilots and your lock sounds, those are the ones that generally take a long time. But as you can see, 561 CVs to read, it's going to take a while. It's really nice that this feature is actually on the ESUE because it's one of the main reasons I like this unit so much. But now that that's done, what you can do is just go down to the second one here and you can see that the default address is now three. Um, now the running number of this particular unit is 45458 so probably just number at the last four digits of its cab. So you can see here enable DCC, enable Railcom, Railcom Plus, it's all good, it's all G, we know what that is, it's fantastic, blah 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 blah. So that's all fine, that's default, we can leave that alone. Um, I'm just going to get the cursor back. So. All we're going to do is just go and in the keyboard. The nice thing about using the VNC is you can actually use a computer keyboard to type all this stuff in. You don't have to use the stupid um, default uh, keyboard on the ESU, which is nice. So we'll just go yes. Okay, so 5458, that's the last four digits of the number. We can turn off analog mode. I don't need this on this particular unit, so we'll just turn it off. This one here is driving, so acceleration. I don't like too much acceleration on these locos because if I need them to stop, I want them to stop. But you can see down here we've got eight pages of driving features on a lock pilot, which is why these things are so good because you can really, really, really fine tune these locos the way you like them. Uh, move delay, power form back up. So all that's fine, it's all default, we don't need it, but we're only five pages in. Analog DC prosing mode, yeah, okay, cool. Cool. Okay, we don't want 28 speed steps, automatic speed step detection, LGB mode, yeah. And I've lost my cursor, where's the cursor going? There it is. Um, persistent speed, persistent functions, okay, cool, that's all good. Motor. I don't like tweaking with this stuff too much, but that's all right. You don't have to if you don't want to. Uh, this is where all your back EMF functions. Now, this is something I'm still trying to learn how to master. So hopefully I'm going to have a video on that in the near future. Uh, I'm just running through how to tweak the back EMF particular motors. Um, if you're running layer with gradients and helixes like I do, the back EMF is actually a really handy thing. A lot of the time, some of my locos will actually stall, so it's not the greatest thing, but this back EMF is essentially a way of preventing that from happening. But um, we're not going to fiddle with that too much. Um, high motor PWM frequency, that's actually a really good feature. So the typical whine of the motor that you get just from a cheap, um, well I say cheap, like a cheap horn medicator, you know, that real buzz sound that you get with the DCC. With a high PWM that actually doesn't really happen as much. So the frequency is higher, but you don't hear the buzzing as much. So it's kind of nice that that's the case. Um, use fix regulation. So we're just going to leave most of this stuff default. Um, we're going to go right down the bottom. Okay. 
so all those features are now locked in. We're going to go back to Create Loco and we'll just call this thing very originally Black 5 running number 45458. Okay. And um, I think I've got a user defined image in here somewhere. Probably don't actually. Doesn't look like it. So this is where you actually upload all your stock images and you can do what you got to do with that. I don't actually have a black five, so I'll just leave it default at the moment. Um, not the end of the world. Okay. Now, you should be able to see, if you got a program on main too, you can just tweak it while it's actually running on the rolling road, which is a nice feature. So, all going well, this should now work. And it doesn't. <laughs> so we'll just cut and we'll come back in just a sec. Okay, we're back. Just had a quick issue. So just for your reference, whenever you want to run a locomotive on a program and track after you've programmed it, um, I always forget to do this, which is why I get frustrated. It helps to have the programming on the main selected. If you have it on programming track, as soon as the programming is finished, the track loses power until you program a new function. So you chuck it on programming on main, it's usually all good to go. So we can just exit out and I'll pan the camera down for you to see. What do I do? So I'll just release control. Select. Black 5, 4, 5, 4, 5, 8. Okay, so now you can see. So I'll just set it to medium speed, I'd say. And off she goes. And I've got to be honest, even though this thing's nearly 10 years old and it's had a rebuild, this new Dakota um, is really getting a smooth performance out of, the, uh, out of the motor. And this thing's running better than it has probably since it was new, nearly 10 years ago. So fantastic result, really sort of pays the way to sort of make the case that budget Dakotas, while they are good for budget model railways, if you really want these things to do what they are designed to do, um, always pays to put that little bit extra, especially into the Dakota. So anyway, that's all from me. So hopefully you enjoyed this short little video. Next video from me, um, hopefully will be um, uploaded in a week. Uh, I'm ready for you to enjoy. So that's going to be me talking about this stuff. Bullfrog snot and whether or not it's worth your time and it's right for your railway. So in the meantime, hopefully you enjoyed this instructional video. If you do have any questions, by all means, please don't hesitate to leave a comment in the comment section. Please be sure to like, share, subscribe. And um, until next time, folks, happy model rail riding. See you next time.